guys. Okay. Oh, the microphones work. Yeah. Yeah. Seems yeah. Like okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Remy, Emmy, hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi. How have you been? Very happy, very happy actually. Tired, of course, like it's like everybody now, but uh, very, very happy. Yeah. yeah, likewise. I'm having a great time. Uh, it's like the first Godocon I'm not organizing, <laughs> which means I get to enjoy, and I've enjoyed it a lot. Like, amazing work to all the volunteers who prepared all this. It's been like the biggest and most successful convention we've ever done, so. Yeah. Congrats. That's amazing. Uh, I'm looking forward to the next one. Yeah. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, what we have here today is, uh, is a short fire chant. Um, because this is an opportunity of a lifetime, I've prepared a couple of questions myself. Once we go through these questions, uh, we will turn to your questions. Uh, when we go through your questions, please don't just shout them. Um, <laughs> um, lift your hand up if you, if you have a question and then I'll repeat it and we'll go through the questions afterwards. Okay. All right. Ready? Sure. Ooh, nice. Okay. So, very first thing. Um, could you tell me a little bit about yourself for people who don't know you yet? So I'm Emilio Coppola, like the executive director of the Godot Foundation, and I've been making like documentation and video tutorials on YouTube for a while. Then I did a plugin that people like, and uh, then I got more involved with the Godot community, and yeah, now I'm working here, really organizing the, the conventions and everything to deal with the organization side of things. And I'm uh, Remy Verschel. I'm the Project maintainer of Godot, and also in another life, I'm the co founder of the W4 Games. Um, but I still spend most of my time working on Godot and maintaining um, the product as a whole, which means uh, basically taking care of coordinating the work of all the contributors and figuring out the release workflow aspects of, like, there's a lot we can talk about later, but um, yeah, I'm mostly, mainly basically helping Juan lead this project um, on the organizational side. Um, there are people listening to this, watching us also live stream, um, and I've got a question that, that could be for people that are new to the e ecosystem, and it is, if you could give us a quick overview of how the engine is developed, how the whole thing, how, how the sausage is made, so to speak. All right, quick overview, that's a challenge. <laughs> yeah. um, so the engine is made by, predominantly made by volunteers uh, who just work on the engine, propose changes, uh, help us review changes, and then we merge these and then we make new releases. Over time, we've grown the project to a size where thanks to donations, we could start hiring people uh, to basically take care more of the like coordination and infrastructure part of the project, uh, but also have some people dedicated to specific areas uh, where we were lacking contributions or where we need someone a bit, that has a bit more bandwidth uh, because we're relying on volunteers, like they come and go, they might have different priorities and like if you want to run your software development as like something relatively reliable, you still need to have some some people you can go after and be like, okay, we need to fix this for the next release, so we have three weeks to figure it out. Um, so currently we have around 10 full-time employees in the field, yeah. a bit less than that. Yeah, like six, seven, six, some part-time, okay. yeah. yeah. Um, and then there's some companies that also donate time from their engineers to work on the projects and individuals who just donate their own time. So I would say like the core team of people who are very like active um, is probably around 30 people. Yeah. Um, and the way we work is like everything is on, on GitHub. So like uh, people report bugs, we try to fix them. People ask for features, we discuss them, we bike shed to death and then after a few years we implement them. <laughs> um, and uh, we have this uh, open chat platform where we discuss with the, with the maintainers and the contributors. And we, more and more, we try to encourage like, area-specific 
inner groups to form, like around GDScript. There's a bunch of contributors. They have their own GDScript channel, which everyone can join, and then they discuss their own priorities, and we try to push for them to drive the development of that area. What's the open chat application? Or, uh, it's uh, called, like, the software is called Rekha Chat, but it's, uh, it's a Godot contributor chat. So when you go to Godot on the community page, there's this contributor chat, and you can register, create a, like a Godot account, and then join and talk with all of us. Yeah, it's also really important to identify what the community wants, right? Because there's so many people using the, the project and each one has their own project, like idea of how this needs to happen. So we need to find what is the best way to accommodate all that. And that's also something that happens between, you know, like the volunteers, like the full-time employees and the other companies in the ecosystem. So Yeah, and it's, it's all very organic. So we have... We have this strength that we have so many volunteer contributors. Like, there's more than 2,000 people who made a change to the engine uh, over time. Uh, so I mentioned there's around 30 in the core team, but like I would say, in average, every month we pr we probably have like more than 100 active contributors. It's so you can see it in each release. We say like, oh, in this release, 70 people did 200 changes, and like we have releases every two weeks. So. <laughs> yeah. it, gives a, it gives an idea. But that gives us the opportunity to have changes driven by engineer people who just think about the engine itself, how should it be architecture and everything, but also users who use Godot and know what they need in their projects so they can provide that perspective. Um, and people who are in touch with the community and can talk with other users and bring feedback. So we try to balance this so that we take the decision that match what the engines needs, like the users needs, basic need. Nice. Uh, every time I hear this, it's just so much information when it comes to how, how it's yeah. done, isn't it? There yeah. are so many different aspects and parts, amazed every time. Now, let's change gears a little bit and uh, let's talk about the, the engine migration. Um, so, very recently, there's been a, a, a big number of uh, new people in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, wh <laughs> Why? Uh, <laughs> Never heard of them. Uh, a good old 4.1 release, I think it was super big, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, how, <laughs> how has the recent influx of new members uh, affected Godot ecosystem? Ha have there been any noticeable changes from your perspectives? I think there was like a, a culture shock a little bit sometimes when we get a big wave of people using the engine because they might be used to some proprietary software where there's this entity that is faceless that you don't know who's making what and you have to kind of shout on social media like this is broken or something like that and it's it's really not how we work right you can come and talk with us on how to you know problem solve this kind of issue so I think it's like the expectations right now that they expect it to be like any other company that is making uh, software like an engine, but it's really not. It's really a community, and the best way to get those conversations going is being part of the community. And I think that's you know something we need to sometimes remind people mm -hmm. that it's a, a community-driven effort, and you can also contribute to it. You don't have to just out of the void, like you can actually go in, help, and it will improve. And you know, it's still like a, a different paradigm to right. what people might be used to. Yeah, there's definitely a bit of that. Um, I would counterbalance it with like, I think it was very positive. Uh, like it's, it's something we've been kind of fearing for years. Like we knew like at, at one point, one big engine in the market will mess up badly and then its users will come to us in hordes and then they will hate everything because it's not the way they are used it to be done. There were a couple of moments where it almost happened, weren't there? Right. Yeah, yeah. There, there was a few like... Fear triggering moments. Like first, uh, <laughs> like quake, uh, how is it called, like before an earthquake, like when you get this... <laughs> yeah. Tremors. Warnings, Tremors, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think it went great. I think like the timing was right. Uh -huh. uh, Godot was like mature enough that people came to it and then they were like, well, this is actually great. Like, I'm, I'm actually having fun. It works well. There's no major showstopper that, uh, that caused a problem to issues. And I think people were, despite like relatively stressful 
conditions for them because like their business was at risk and like there was a lot of frustration. I feel people were very positive and like yeah. Yeah, we yeah, saw yeah. like a major influx of like amazing content being made with Godot. So that like, okay, wow, I didn't know Godot could do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, when we get new people that are trying it out, they do really nice demos that we somehow, you know, we never knew about this person and suddenly it's everywhere, like demos are super high quality and you can see that people are having fun and that's also like something we see systematically, like people trying it out and they get hooked on making more and more and more stuff until you know, they decide to use it full time and that's very good that we were prepared to you know to accommodate those users in terms of like yes this is ready for making stuff and uh, yeah it, it, well, it needed a little push but unfortunately like it will happen again and uh, we'll see this several times in the future I believe mm -hmm. so I hope that for the next one we are more ready and we have like more things for everybody and a better structure so next time next time yeah i mean this with how this sort of like uh, companies work it's inevitable at this point that yeah. this will happen again so um, it's waves that come and go but every time like more of the people stay on the show and they're like okay this is nice here but there's yeah. others just ebb away and they go back to it and then they come and then yeah, because for them, like they have a product and they have investors, they have shareholders that they need to make happy in terms of like the profit that they are generating, and you know, with more time and more scale, the engine is starting to be more of a side business. And for us, this is like what we want to do and what we like, and we use it. So it's you know like what we focus on. We don't have any other kind of like ads business that we need to grow or anything like that. So. We are always going to be working on the engine, but for them, it might not make sense in the future economically to keep doing it. So eventually, they will, you know, I'm not saying like that it will happen, but it could happen at any time. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of positives, and, and uh, I've seen a lot of positives as well on the internet. You know, this has been a, a, a big change out of nowhere, right? Just overnight, this just changed completely. Um, in Within the process of making the engine, there's a lot of little processes. I imagine that the influx was also on the GitHub side of things. Um, have there been any processes that you noticed needed changing or needed um, upgrading, so to speak, because of the new people coming in? Yeah, to some extent. Like, um, we did see a lot more activity. Uh, I think like double the amount of notifications we get. So like, it used to be that you, we could try not to work during the weekend and then on Monday be able to catch up with what happened during the weekend. Now on Monday it's kind of like 500 notifications, okay. I'm hoping yeah. that the people who did contribute during the weekend did a good job because I'm not going to read all that. <laughs> <laughs> I am, um, uh, actually. But, but yeah, yeah. It, um, I think it didn't trigger the need to change things, it just confirmed that, like, we, we keep evolving the way we work because Godot keeps growing organically, like, we used to say like the, good, the community doubles size every year and then now it doubles size in a month. Um, so we keep evolving our processes. We went from me being the product manager, managing everything to having a production team with like five, six people sharing that workload. Um, and we still need to do more work to spread the workload a bit more. Uh, now what we identified recently, for example, is like, we want to have better guidelines for contributors on like how is actually the process because a lot of it is kind of informal like it's something that we all share because we've been doing this together there's a lot of like knowledge that's just in between us and we have some documentation that explains how we do things but it's not very clear and some people need something that's very clear uh, so we want to standardize a bit this thing so that it's easier for new contributors to understand like why is it taking forever for my pull request to be reviewed? Or like, why am I getting this review on code style stuff, but no, nobody told me yet whether they want the feature or not? So all this, we, we, we see that we need to, to communicate that better, basically, with the people who contribute. Uh, because when we don't communicate enough, it often leads to some frustrations, uh, and that's, that's not nice. Yeah, also the processes we have for a certain scale, when you start including more and more and more people, they, they just don't work anymore. But 
like we we had to add more people and yeah shout out to Yuri who has been doing an amazing work also like on the production team yes But yeah, always like trying to learn how to how to deal with the current situation. It's an evolving thing. Mm. Uh, with a shout out to Yuri, I recently yeah. noticed that the speed of releases has uh, seriously picked up in the recent times. Um, how how has that been? This uh, faster cycle of release has that been a good experience? Do you think now looking back was that a good uh, step to take? Yeah, yeah, I think it was. Yeah, I think there was a lot of like. Um, unknowns in terms of when a Godot version was going to release, which was good for the memes, right? Like waiting for Godot, really good. But not if you want to have like a production cycle where you actually know when you can actually start making a big change and getting it through the process of merging it and reviewing it and all that. I think now it's a, a saner way also for the developers that want to, to help to know when things are going to happen. And also for content creators and anyone else that's covering like the releases, I was doing that myself before. Like, when is the new Godot version dropping? Oh, it's today, let's make a video quickly. <laughs> uh, you can now know it's kind of like a four-month cycle. I think it's been a, a great uh, experiment yeah. so far. Yeah. And if you look at, like, I think the release blog post in like, Godot 2.1, I think, every time I was, I was writing this blog post and saying, like, for the next cycle, really want to go towards like faster releases and not drag them on for so long. And then like 2.1, we're like, okay, let's go for a short release cycle and have 2.2, and then we start working on it. And then one goes like, okay, no, we need to modernize everything. We need to rewrite everything. And then we worked on Godot 3 for two years. And then same after Godot 3.2, we're like, okay, we need to modernize everything. We worked on Godot 4 for four years. <laughs> And now we finally managed to do what I've been wanting to do for forever, which is to have a short release cycle with like releases every few months. So now we are aiming for like every four months. Uh, we're a couple of weeks late, but we're kind of sticking to that. Um, and that, that's amazing because that, that reduces a lot of the pressure we had to get things in until the last minute. And then that would lead to like, a beta phase that was very buggy because we were still very deep into the development phase and then the release candidates we were still like finalizing some stuff so it was dragging on forever but now we can be like okay feature freeze we start the beta phase all the features get pushed we this will be merged in a month so it's like you don't have to wait forever you know your feature is still going to be worked on yeah, I remember waiting for a feature in 3.5 for a really long time, <laughs> and now the, the faster cycle is also better from my perspective mm -hmm. of, a, of a user of the engine, because I know that there's a fix, and that fix is not coming in two years, but um, you know, it might be there in a, in a month. Exactly, and that also means we, have, we take like, less risk, because sometimes like, we see, okay, there's a PR, like, we also really want that fix. So we're like, okay, let's merge it, and then, oh, well, we broke all of the other things and then you, you add a lot to the cycle while now we can just say like okay let's just hold up the, the gas and just give it some time let's merge it in the next cycle and see like then we have three months to make sure it's, it's fine. And um, has the, the time frame been good? Have you considered making it longer, shorter? I think it's been good but yeah I guess that if we need to change it like it depends more on our release basis right like there are some features that might not fit into one release cycle that, you know, or right now, like the Godot.com got a little bit in the middle of like the release, so some things come up. But I think like for months, at least we need to keep trying. Yeah, I, I think it's good for months. Like we'll, we'll see how it scales over time, but uh, we still have to address the big things where like, even with this cycle, like if we merge a big new feature very close to the end of the development cycle. So like we do three months development, one month bug, bug fixing. But if you merge something very big just before the bug fixing, so the beta phase, then you might end up still having a very rocky beta phase because there was a lot of issues. So we had that this time, for example, with mesh compression. We merged like just before the beta and then, oh, okay, porting a project from Godot 4.1, there's all these issues. And then we iterated in each beta and it took a lot of effort. Um, so I went through those betas. Yeah, so <laughs> th these are the kind of things where we might start identifying like, okay, it's actually ready, close to the beta phase. Well, we're still technically in feature development time, but maybe let's wait for the next 
phase and just take our time anyway. Right, right. Overall, um, yeah. Overall, also from what I'm hearing, this four-month cycle sounds really good. Um, now, on to a question. Uh, let's move on to this question that I've heard a lot, and um, uh, it, it, it comes up from time to time. And I think it's good to uh, to mention this, al al although I think I know roughly where it stands. But what about the asset marketplace? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, if you <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. It's it's a conversation like we're having like. Uh, very actively, but as soon as possible, right? Like if we say a deadline and then we don't meet it, then we're going to disappoint a lot of people, but it's a very high priority. Like we're working really hard on getting it right. And, you know, it's a bit more tricky than it looks. People see us, you know, like I was also a web developer. I know you can make a store really quickly, like, techno like the technology is easy, but then doing all the legal stuff, it's a bit more tricky, right? Like if you start taking money from people and then paying developers, like how does that fits with the non-profit like, organization we have, how that fit with the different areas, like it's not the same if you are someone in Europe or in the Americas or in Asia. So those things were being ironed out and we're going to do like a slow release in terms of like first a few testers, getting feedback in terms of how the experience is, like using it and then opening open it more and more and more slowly. But yeah, like we need to make it right. There's a lot of things that we have an asset library, which is all free assets and all that, that doesn't include the worst part of these things, which is the money. As soon as you involve money, you get people submitting things that they don't really own, AI-generated content, like a lot of spam and things like that that can be problematic. So we need to make sure that we account for those as well. And that also requires persons that work full-time on it, right? So the I, I would like to have it as soon as possible. I don't want to say any date, but it is really a high priority. So not today, but surely tomorrow. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, earlier this year, I met you at uh, Gamescom. That was, a, that was a game yes. show. It was, uh, it was the first time that I, uh, that I visited uh, Gamescom. That's one thing. And uh, I was super happy to see the Godot stand there. Um, I think this year was the first one. Was this the first year when Godot was present at shows? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we started this year thanks to the sponsoring by W4. Like, we were able to be at GDC in March and also in Gamescom, and uh, it was and a really... And RAM attack for uh, Gamescom. Exactly, yeah. Uh, but it was really a really good experience, like uh, meeting a lot of people in person, it's always nice. And being in those events also, like, make... I was a little bit skeptical, I have to say, like, you know, like, why are we going there to be there? Like, we don't really have anything to sell, really, right? Like, I don't have any product that you can give me money for. But it was really positive because you you get taken more seriously, the people start considering it as an option, and they start thinking about offering their services to Godot users, and that's better for everybody, right? Like, you got a game that's using some proprietary libraries, like it could be WISE or FMOD, they want to go to Godot, and if those integrations are not there, you're gonna have issues, like the sound guy in your studio is not gonna like you if you tell them you have to use Godot Audio, right? Um, so, being in those events made us also like get a lot of those uh, connections and, and interest that was really positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we also see that like to gain more relevance in the industry, Godot needs to be seen at these kind of events. Like at, we were at GDC uh, this year and like a lot of the people we met, even though they are all game developers, they had never heard about Godot. So like game developers who never heard that Godot even exists. Um, so. That's surprising to us, right? Yeah. We're very surprised here. <laughs> uh, now maybe after September they probably heard about it, um, but maybe not. And we'll see next year what's the ratio. But you need to be there and need to be seen so that people know you're not just like a fluke or like, oh, here's a, a VC-backed uh, Web3 engine that says they can do everything metaverse and then they disappear two years later. So you need to show that you're there and you're reliable and that you grow the pool of, of games which have been made with Godot. Like we had big successes uh, last year and this year that started putting Godot on the radar of, of developers like Dome Keeper, Brotato, Case of the Golden Idol, Cassette Beasts. So like we start having some, some good titles we can mention and people might have played one of these without knowing 
without coming to it because it's Godot. So yeah, um, yeah. it's important to have some open source, like free and open source, like presence in these sort of events because the gaming industry is really, really outdated. In like, if you look at other areas in technology, most of the technology is open source. Everybody's running an open source servers, and you know, like. But then you get to the gaming industry and most of it is proprietary. And I think it's important to let people know that there's an alternative, right? And there's a proper way of doing like this, this sort of... Do you think this is going to change? Do you think that more engines are going to start open sourcing themselves? I'm not sure if they're going to start open sourcing maybe some parts of it, but I think it's a trend if you check like product, like the Things like, for instance, Blender, which wasn't that common before, but with time, like people started using it more and more. Like I believe that now almost all game developers know it, about it, and they might have used it or they are learning how to use it. And it might be the same with Godot in the future, right? Like, but if we don't start like making like a showcase of like this is possible with open source, right? It's not this old kind of like janky stuff that you get in some open source projects, but it's like professional ready, right? Like you can start using it for your product. I, I think it's, it's really important to be there and yeah, show this. Yeah. yeah, talking about Blender, like I think we're, we're really lucky that Blender paved the way uh, yes. to show that you can have high quality open source projects uh, because otherwise we would have had like, like the prejudices that Blender had to fight were like, I've been doing open source for 20 years, so like I've, uh, I've, seen, all, I've seen it all. And like we had a much easier time with Godot where it was not just assumed that it would be janky and crappy and with terrible UX for being open source. Uh, there's of course still things which are janky and need to be improved, but I think we, are, we don't have to shy in front of some of the other non-open source projects. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, that's, minds are changing towards open source and people are seeing that like this can be very high value even if it's free. I never thought about it, but you're, you're right, yeah. Uh, I started using Blender when it was 2.49. The UI was legendary. <laughs> it was amazing. I was sad to see it go. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, it, uh, it removed the misconceptions, right? Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like it you say, paved the way. Simplifies the pitch a lot. Like it's like Blender, right? It's yeah. Very easy to understand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, the time is almost nigh for community questions. Let's just do one more question that I have for you, super quick, and that is, if if you know, if priorities were anything, if you could do anything that you wanted, if you didn't need to worry about what the community wants, and you could add, change, or remove any one thing in Godot. What would it be? Mm. It, it's, it's, I would maybe not add, but as we said like it, in a few times, like I would start rewriting a lot of stuff in GDScript so I can start contributing to those because I don't want to touch C++ either. So yeah, that, that's what I would. <laughs> hmm. I would want to just focus on UX. So like really improves a lot of the things where like it's working and it's not horrible, but it just goes in the way. And like every time I use like the export dialogue or something like this, I'm like, ah! The export dialogue <laughs> is a good one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Would you say that the export dialogue is your biggest um, UX pain point? I don't know. It's shared across everything, like, but it's, it's one of the things that we identified like would be good to, to redo. Um, but like also the product manager, I think there's a lot of things that can be, like not me, but the, the tool. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, right, gotcha, all right. And, and like, yeah, in general, I would say like, focusing on paper cuts, like just taking time and go see all the studios using Godot and like watching them use it and be like, okay, <laughs> you need to fix that, like I remember Last time we went in Brussels, we saw we met Sander, who showed us like yeah. when they were working on uh, Koira at, uh, in Brussels, and then he was like, "Yeah, so we made all these plugins and blah blah." And it's like, "Why is your FPS editor at 10 FPS? Like, how do you work with this?" And he's like, "No, it's not a problem. Like, I made this tool that cuts everything so that it runs fine at runtime." It's like, "Yeah, but the editor is horrible." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We were like this. And he was so positive about yeah. it, like, yeah, he really liked it. And we were like, how can you work with this? That's yeah, so in, in general, I wow. feel like game developers have a very high tolerance to jank. 
And like when I use Godot, I'm like, how do people use that? Like, I, <laughs> <laughs> I remember you mentioned this a, cu a couple of times in the 3D uh, part of things, yeah. right? Because you, you pr predominantly uh, look at 2D and then sometimes you have to do a little bit of 3D. Yeah, I don't have much 3D experience, but whenever I try to use it, like I did a game jam in, uh, in April with like um, Andy, who's somewhere here. And like it was my first time making a, an actual 3D game for like uh, with the two devs basically, uh, two programmers, and I was just like, I want to just scroll out to see the scene, and then I'm blocked for whatever reason. It's like, how do people deal with this? <laughs> <laughs> how do people navigate in 3D? Peeps, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now let's move on to. <laughs> Let's move on to your questions. Hands up, who's got a question? I'll try to come a little bit closer and then and I'll repeat it. Uh, the question was whether you're coming to GDC next year. Yeah, yeah. we'll uh, have an even bigger booth than this year. And we are actually, um, that Great question because that lets me plug uh, a small <laughs> request. So, like the W4 uh, like ordered um, or pre-ordered a booth for GDC, and we're trying to create a Godot ecosystem pavilion. So, we want to have multiple companies from the Godot ecosystem uh, who participate there. So, like we will sublet basically a small booth. Like we, we rented a very big space, uh, and then we'll have also some some indie devs that will invite. Uh, like we did uh, last year. So if any of you have a company doing things in the Godot ecosystem and you have some spare few thousand dollars to spend on events, uh, get in touch with us because so we are, we're not trying to make a profit on this, like we're subsidizing this because GDC just costs like, you don't want to hear how much it costs. Uh, but so we're offering this space and then we're trying to close this down very soon because then we need to start basically fully designing the booth and getting it uh, prepared. So any company interested in being at GDC, uh, get in touch with uh, W4. We have a blog post about this, or you can talk to me uh, anytime. That's awesome. I might be getting in touch. <laughs> Would be great. Thanks. All right. Yes. Right, so the question was whether uh, Godot is going to be at Gamescom Game Arena instead of the business um, area. Yeah, I think it would be nice. It would require more staff, unfortunately, like, uh, because it opens for more like, time. You need to have like, a lot of people there. But it would be nice so you can get a place where all the games, like Godot games, are and are playable. So I think like, we'll try, but it depends really on how many like, people we have available for it. Uh, it's still not really clear, but we would like to try. I remember Game Maker had a really nice stand. Yeah, yeah, right yeah. yeah, yeah. We have been yeah. hanging out with them. It was really nice. Yeah. Like, yeah. Right. Okay. Someone, um, someone over there. I think I saw a hand. No. Miguel. Ah, Miguel. <laughs> yes. There you are. Hello. Uh, oh, that's loud. Um, there are currently, in this very moment, 2,039 open pull requests. At Remy, how do you find the time to go through all of these? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I used to stress a lot over the amount of pull requests we had. Um, like in the first years where I was managing all this, I was really like pushing, like we need to reduce this backlog. Like I remember at, at one point I was like anxious about having 50 open pull requests. Um, <laughs> And, and like the project just kept growing at a pace that we couldn't match. Uh, so we just do our best with the resources we have. Um, but it still works well. Like it, it looks like a lot, 2,000, but we merge 700 per month. So it's like this is just three months of backlog, in, technically, um, which we will probably never catch up to. Like at some point we discuss, like, okay, should we just? clothe everything that's old, but there's actually a lot of very good and useful things in the backlog that we just never got to. Uh, and once in a while, we, one, one comes up and then we discuss it and we're like, yeah, that's actually a good idea, but the contributor is not active anymore, let's just take it over. 
So if you have a, con a PR that's been sitting there for ages, um, it's always a good idea to just come on the chat and then nag us a bit and be like, is anyone interested in that? Because not everyone sees everything in the contribution. So like a lot of it is like, yeah, me or others in the production team going through things and being like, okay, this has been waiting for a while. Let's, let's try to push it further. But sometimes if you come to the chat and you drop it, you might find like a few contributors who are interested and just didn't know that it existed. Like just today we discussed with Adam about some stuff and Adam was like, yeah, how about we implement this? And I was like, yeah, there's a pull request doing this that's been waiting for further work. So uh, yeah. It's, it's a very big resource, actually, of basically work in progress stuff. Some of it is ready, some of it is not, uh, but it's very... So it's, it's worth, if you're looking for something, it's worth doing a research in a, a search in the list of open pull requests, and you might find something that you want, actually, and you can use it in your, in your build, test it, and then say, yeah, hey, I tried it, it's great, so it would be great if this moved along in the review cycle. All right. Is do you always do what you want while developing? <laughs> no, not really. I don't think. Like the, the problem when you do when you want to do what you want is that there's other people as well that want to do what they want, and sometimes they don't uh, match. So what we really do first is discussing what do we want, right? Like what the, what the team wants. And once we have that, yes, we do what we want in terms of like, uh, are we going to implement it or not, depending on if you're a volunteer or if you are working for someone that like, needs that feature to get in. So yeah. yeah. Everything we do is like cons consensus driven. So some yeah. decisions can take a lot of time to reach a consensus, but when when we have it, then it, it is what we want. So like we, we end up working on what we, would, we do think is the right thing to do. Uh, but yeah, that can be a process. But like if there's a ton of bugs being reported, like kind of automatically what we want is to fix the bugs because we don't want Godot to be a broken mess. Yeah, also I found like trying to contribute to other open source projects before, like when I approached the Godot community and I started discussing some things, like I didn't find so much resistance. Like and when you really explain what your issues are, people really change their mind and they really are making the best effort to understand what your problem is, and you get into a really nice like uh, consensus on, on fixing it. And I haven't seen that. I know that sometimes we don't do like uh, our best in terms of like arriving to the solution like uh, quicker, but I think that if you compare it with any other open source project, like it's really, really open for discussion and it's really, really productive. Yeah, if you don't have that positive experience, like try again, like don't despair. Like there's always some back shedding and stuff like this in any project, but overall uh, we're doing our best to like listen and then uh, reach, reach consensus with the people who, who propose things. Do we have any more questions? Ah, there we are. Seems to have doubled. Oh. <laughs> so the financial support seems to have doubled in the recent times. Do you already can share maybe ideas or priorities where you want to spend this money or from an organizational or just from an engine point of view? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, the, it was great that I had the PR ready for like the developer fund the same day that Unity decided to, to do like some news communications as well. Um, we got extra funding, but we also were in the red before. Like we, it's not like we were like, you know, making enough money to pay everyone that was working on the project. So this will allow us, of course, to not be in the red anymore, which is really important, but hire a couple of people. And yeah, we are, we are discussing which are the areas that need it the most, but uh, there's the first thing like we did was just try to see who were the candidates that, that were more available to, to work with us and that we already, like we're working with them as maintainers and then identifying if it makes sense to Know, start a, a, a working package for them to, to work on it. But yeah, there's of course things that they've been on the backlog for some time, but we need to, to improve. But they also need to match the availability from someone that can fix it and that knows how we work. It, it, like, you know, it needs to already know Godot ideally because it's really hard to, to hire from the outside and have to go through all the training and all that. 
but, but yeah, like I think ideally we will hire at least two more people now, and uh, I I have to keep raising funds so we can hire more yeah. because we need way more. Like I remember after all this news, like we got asked like an interview by the Verge, it like was like. And how were the news received at your office? And it's like, we don't have an office. Like, <laughs> <laughs> what office, right? Like, so, but, yeah. And do you know the positions of the people that you're looking for? Yes, there's a lot, more than we can hire. But yes, like, we have a couple of people in mind, but I don't want to announce anything, just so don't... If it doesn't work out, I don't want it to be, like, uh, yeah, I don't want to out anyone. <laughs> but we will announce it, like... Ideally, um, we had it on our backlog. That's the problem of being so few people, right? Like, we wanted to communicate after all the success, like, what it meant to us and what we're going to be doing with that. But then it also coincided with the GodotCon organizing and with the 4.2 release. And it's really hard sometimes to find the time to make all those, like, communications happen, you know. But after the GodotCon, we will be able to communicate more in terms of what's our plans with the funding and, and all that. Hello? Okay. Um, what sort of lessons and learnings have you observed in other um, open source projects like Blender that you try to, say, uh, get inspired from and apply to Godot, or maybe like try and avoid applying without naming names? Like, I'm just sort of curious what you sort of have seen other people do well. Um, yeah, well, you don't really have to be really, really like uh, smart to notice that we had almost the same layout as the the developer fan from Blender and things like that. Uh, we really look up to them in terms of like how they handle all this because it's a new organization that we need to figure out all these things. You cannot really Google on YouTube like how to raise funds for open source projects. Right? You need to kind of see what's around. But we, I also have been researching we are naming names and talking with people. There's a different sort of organization in open source world where you get a lot of seats on a board that people can basically pay to be there and to like advise the direction of the project and that's something that we don't want to do. Um, so it feels really, really corporate and it doesn't feel like it really aligns with what the user wants. It's more like what this sort of like paying board wants. Even if the project is open source, it feels more like it's a product of one of these big companies. Um, but yeah, we will, we will see how we can improve it like in the model we have without compromising in, in those sort of like important positions. That's why looking at Blender is a good, even if we are not the same, right? Like Blender does have different organizations since at least like five organizations at the same time. We are not, but there's a lot of things that we can do to raise those funds that are, it's really good to, to look like at what they are doing. And I would add, like, I think one of the biggest lessons I learned from looking at a lot of open source projects uh, over years is, like, um, the value of really driving your open source project as a community effort and making sure that everyone benefits, has the possibility to benefit the same from the, op the open project. Um, so, I mean, it's never been a question for us, but, like, you see a lot of more company-driven open source project where they open source their technology and uh, but there's still an asymmetric relationship between them and the users uh, because most of the technology is just is still like driven by them there's a contributor license agreement so they could relicense the, the code at any time uh, so it still has value because it's open source you can use it uh, it's still like still good uh, but it's not as good as what you can get with something like Godot or Blender where everyone who contributes to Godot benefits the same way, which means that it's really your product, uh, and you can, you know that you will be able to keep using it because it's, yeah, it's part of the commons and it will stay there forever. I think we have time for one more question. Just one last one, if it's a quick one. Oh, there is a quick question over there. Hello, thank you. Uh, the question is a uh, touchy question. With all the influx of the new serious game developers, are there any plans to update the logo? 
I know. <laughs> okay. The, I, I will do like a, a fake answer, but there are some conversations about updating maybe the desktop icon, so it's different, mm. easy to differentiate the versions. But there's a, a, yeah, <laughs> I know Jackie really wants that. But uh, no, I think we all like our logo. Like I know that the, the professional logo right now it should be like black, white, and very like a, a square probably, you know. Uh, and I think those, those really work when you have some investors and you need to justify your design department and you need to make them do a brand redesign of everything. But for us, I think it's, it's you know, it's already super recognizable. Like everybody like who uses Godot really likes it. And the people who complain, they like they also offer other alternatives and they can use that. They, you can recompile it at your logo and you know you don't have to like you don't have to use the robot if you don't like it. But uh, there are no plans to, to change oh. it. Yeah, I think brand identity that we created is like powerful now and that's there's no value in changing that. And I think it's always a hot topic, like some people are really obsess about this, but I don't think the logo matters much in terms of how the technology will be adopted in the industry. Like, Linux has the most horrible logo, and <laughs> it's like powering all the servers in the world, and Android is a cute small Android, and it's also like a huge piece of technology, so I think it's not that important. I might. I, I think we should change a bit the font of the payload, like game engine, like it doesn't scale down well. Yeah. So there's some technical issues in the logo that at some point we might want to solve, but that's also, that's also a big change. Like I, I've been in projects where we tweak the logo and then five years down the road you still find the old version of the logo. Yeah, you still uh, can find like the old, like the big Joe, big Joe Godot logo, yeah. 2 logo around, but yeah. What we've been doing a little bit more is trying to have maybe the outline a little bit more lately in our communications because it's easier to see like if you have a color background or anything like that. But yeah, we like the, the robot. I think it's fun and it's a, it's a game engine to, to do fun things, so. So yeah, that will be it for the fireside chat. Peeps, thank you very much. And Remy, Emmy, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.